<laughs> so, you did manage to come after all. My dear Watson, I don't promise lightly. I even have the confetti. <laughs> See? <laughs> and I have to offer you my most hearty felicitations. My dear Holmes. John! Just leave me for your wife who calls. John! That... <laughs> yes, sure. The only selfish action in our whole association that I can recall. Ah, uh, forgive your time, eh? Mr. Holmes! <laughs> Mrs. Watson. Sincerest congratulations on this happy day. Thank you, sir. I know my husband would have been sorely troubled not to have seen you. Shall you be coming to the wedding breakfast, Holmes? Alas, no. Oh. I'm sorry. A case? John? Well, we shouldn't keep the carriage waiting. Yes, I relish the chance to practice my throwing action. <laughs> my love? We shall see you on our return then, Holmes. It's from your honeymoon. Where are you going? We must expect you, Mr. Holmes, to deduce that for yourself. Ah. <laughs> Bon voyage, Watson! Mrs. Watson! <laughs> The Blanched Soldier by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dramatised for radio by Roger Danes With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson and featuring Hannah Gordon as Mrs Watson and Robert Glenister as James Dodd The Blanched Soldier was over that way, Baldy. Yes, so I did. Don't seem to be now, though, do they, Simpson? Uh, some way behind us, I reckon. Booked it back to Pretoria and safety, I shouldn't wonder. Anderson. Corporal. Take a turn back over our tracks. See if you can find them. Tell them to get a move on. The enemy isn't likely to wait about for us to catch him up. No sooner said than done. Oh. Down, Simpson! Get down! Can you see them? Not a thing. Kruger's friends know this broken belt ground too well. I'll tell that to Anderson. He knows it by now. Too well. We'll lose the horses in a second if we don't move quick. You'd be mad to chance it, Emsworth. If we keep to cover, we can wait till the rest come Wait up. for the enemy to pick us off at leisure? Not likely, Baldy. You with me? Brave man. You go first. I'll give you a covering fire. All right. Good luck. Yeah, good luck yourself. Here goes nothing, then. They say there are two stages. The first is when one fears what's going to die. Breathe deep now. The second, when one fears one's not going to die after all. Try to watch the horizon. John, I can't even see the horizon. I'm sure I saw Cap Greenay just then. Don't try to cheer me up. I just thank goodness the rest of our European tour will be by train. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer to lie down? Oh, no, John. No, John. You're not doing too badly, you know. Even some of the crew are looking a bit green. If you can't find anything more helpful to say... I'm sorry. It won't be too long now. Oh. You cannot be long back from South Africa, Mr. Dodd. No. No, sir. A matter of a couple of months. Ah. You had a, a satisfactory war. That is, I survived it, Mr. Holmes. You were in the Imperial Yeomanry, I perceive. I was, yes. Middlesex Corps, no doubt. <laughs> You must be some kind of wizard, Mr. Holmes. On the contrary. I've lately been active in the exposure of a charlatan shaman of the utmost depravity. The Turkish business, I read of it. Yes, the newspapers favoured my involvement with their usual lack of accuracy. Your own, though, sir, is astonishing to me. 
You see everything. I see no more than you, Mr. Dodd. I notice what I see, that is all. You have a tan upon your face that an English son could never give, a handkerchief carried in the sleeve instead of the pocket. With your bearing, that marks you as an army man. So the late war gave you South Africa, I see that. Not the kind of a riding man, but your beard shows that you are not in a regular regiment. And as to Middlesex Corps, your card here has already told me that. In what way? You're a stockbroker, sir, from Throgmorton Street. What other regiment would you have joined? And so, what's been happening at Tuxbury Old Park? This is clairvoyance, Mr. Holmes. Well, no doubt I could make you believe that, but I so unscrupulous as the Sultan Shaman, but there is no mystery. Your letter was on the headed writing paper from Tuxbury Old Park. Of course. And by the pressing terms in which you wrote, it was clear that something both sudden and important had happened. By God, sir! You have made a most damnable intrusion into the privacy of my family. Colonel Emsworth, I am sorry... The matter will take... not bear discussion. You were here, Mr. Dodd, as a guest in my house. You abused my hospitality and have become a spy upon my family. There is less than justice, Colonel. Indeed it is, sir. Aren't you for leave? As soon as there is a train. Oh, damnation, there's none tonight. Believe me, if there were, you would be on it. I regret you should misconstrue in this way. There I, is I... a London train at half past eight in the morning. The trap will be at the door at eight. I want you to know, Colonel Emsworth. I have nothing more to say to you, sir, save that I have no wish ever to see you again. I have no intention of being intimidated, sir, by anything you may say or do. You call me a spy. It is you who have made me so by lying to me. If I see you here after tomorrow without my leave, that shall be within my rights, Mr. Dodd, if I use violence. I warn you. I shall get to the bottom of this. But place. I warn you, sir. Come back, and I'll shoot you. By God, I will! He's a hard nail, is Colonel Emsworth. The Crimean VC. Yes, the greatest martinet in the army in his day. And it was a day of rough language, too. And so he kicked you out. That was what it amounted to. I can tell you, Mr. Holmes, I couldn't have stuck him at all if I hadn't been there for Godfrey's sake. Perhaps you care to explain. I would got into the way of supposing you knew it all without being told. <laughs> Even I cannot work without the facts, Mr. Dodd. Well, then. You were quite right, of course, that I'm lately from the war in South Africa. Godfrey Emsworth was my mate almost from the moment I joined the squadron. My mate. That means a good deal in the army. He is Colonel Emsworth's son. Only child. Mm. The same fighting blood as the old man, too. We were the sort of pals who... Well, you can only be that when you share the same joys and sorrows. When you... When you're mates, really. Yeah. Go on. The Boer gave us a year of hard fighting. Then one day there was an action by Diamond Hill outside Pretoria. Here goes nothing then. Oh, come on, boy. Like the wind. Oh. Simpson! Simpson! Oh. Bullet from an elephant gun. And you? I wasn't there. Godfrey and a couple of others had gone on ahead of us. Got lost, I don't know. Brother Boer was waiting for them anyway. But Emsworth wasn't killed. Oh, no, no. I had a letter from him, from the hospital in Cape Town. Then one from Southampton when he'd been shipped back home to England. But since then, Mr. Holmes, never a word. Not for six months and more. And you can see no reason. Mr. Holmes, he was my closest pal. Bellamy. We could see that this evening. What is it, John? It's uh, a theatrical spectacle. I did manage to construe that from the poster. It's from Maupassant's novel. Oh, is that meant to be rather daring? Not for Paris. <laughs> I think I'd rather not, John, if you don't mind. <sighs> Tea, then? There must be somewhere close. I don't know. We seem to be a little out of the way. But then, having seen all that we have... I don't really know where we're meant to go next. Well, it looks as though if we just go a little further down here, see? The Quai des Orfebvres. Mm. Is that where we are? Yes. I wondered why we just happened along here. And that building is it. Is it? <laughs> I merely wanted to see. 
Can I really have married a man who would sniff when he viewed the Sacre Coeur and call the Eiffel Tower clever? Well, it is. And this man would then walk half across the City of Light in order to gaze upon the central criminal police station. It is a very famous building, you know. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I know. Mr. Sherlock Holmes has got a lot to answer for. Well, he's your friend. Yes. But you're my wife. And that's a cafe. Come on. I take it it was not at Colonel Emsworth's invitation that you went to Tuxbury Old Park. <laughs> no. Godfrey's mother. She's a gentle little white mouse of a woman. Sent me a quite amiable reply to my letter to her. This was after the old curmudgeon of a father had spiked my guns on my first advance. You wrote to Colonel Emsworth first? Certainly. I observed polite convention, as you would expect. When the war was over and we all got back, I wrote to Godfrey's father and asked where and how my closest pal was. I'd been meaning to do it for six months, after all. But I got no answer. You're certain the Colonel received your letter? Oh, yes. It was pure discourtesy on his part. But I half expected that from what Godfrey had said of the old man. The father and son did not always agree. Hardly ever, I should say. Godfrey had far too much spirit to stand the Colonel's bullying ways. I waited a bit, and then I wrote again. This time you had a reply? Short, gruff. Godfrey had gone on a voyage round the world, not likely to be back for a year. That was all? Well, I wasn't satisfied, Mr. Holmes. Godfrey wouldn't drop a pal like that. The whole thing seemed damned unnatural. So, you wrote to my wife, sir? I was going to be in the neighbourhood, Colonel, on business. In the neighbourhood? When we're five miles from anywhere? You'll surprise me. I have business in Bedford, sir. I thought I had a certain amount of interest which I might tell Godfrey's mother of our shared experiences in South Africa. Oh, yes. Uh, we have, of course, only your word for that. I have Godfrey's letters to me, sir. On your person, sir? In my pocket, sir. Kindly let me see them. Do you not find it natural, Colonel Emsworth, that I should wonder at Godfrey's sudden silence on his return to England? Or that I should wish to know what has become of my friend? I have some recollection that I've already corresponded with you, sir. That you already know what has become of my son. His health was in a poor way when he returned from the Cape, having been gravely wounded in an action at which his solicitous friends were not present. That is less than fair. His mother and I were both of the opinion that Godfrey was in need of complete rest and change of air. And that is the reason for this voyage around the world. As you have been informed already. Why, so I have, Colonel. I would be obliged, sir, if you would have the extreme goodness to pass on that explanation to any other of his closest pals who may be interested in the matter. Certainly I shall do that, Colonel. Perhaps you would be kind enough to let me have the name of the steamer on which Godfrey has sailed, together with that of the shipping line and the date of his departure, so I may have the opportunity of getting a letter through to him. Mr. Dodd. Many people would take offence at your infernal pertinacity. You must put it down to my very real love for your son. Nevertheless, your insistence reaches close to the point of damned impertinence. Am I to take it that you will not tell me where Godfrey is? I will tell you this, sir. Your meddling can serve no useful purpose. Perhaps I should be the judge of... Drop that. these inquiries, Mr. Dodd. Clearly, you do not intend to heed the Colonel's advice. Would you, Mr. Holmes? Perhaps not. No, perhaps about it in my case. I vowed from that moment I'd never rest until my friend's fate had been cleared up. And you cast that in Colonel Emsworth's face? I hope I'm better as a friend than as an enemy, Mr. Holmes. No, for Godfrey's sake, I knuckled under for the time being. Mm. And eventually the Colonel accepted he couldn't really throw out a guest his wife had invited fair and square to stay the night. Oh, he has some social graces then, at least. But it was a dull dinner we had that evening, I can tell you. Mrs. Emsworth questioned me eagerly enough about her son, of course. But you learned nothing from her? Not with the old man present at table. Oh. How did the Colonel react to your stories? Depressed. Morose. To be honest, I think he hardly listened. Yet you were speaking good of his son. For a time. But I made an excuse to get to bed as soon as I decently could. My room was on the ground floor. Large. 
bare and as gloomy as the rest of Tuxbury Old Park. <laughs> 